Hey, folks, we just want you to know that all the views and opinions expressed on military historians or people, too, are ours and that of our guests. They do not represent any organizations, employers, and other entities with which we and our guests may be affiliated or associated. Okay? Got it? Enjoy the show. Hey, man. You doing all right? I'm okay. How are you? Doing well. Getting ready for three, possibly four days of intense heat up in Macon, Georgia. For the, uh, we got the, the junior team tennis state championships. Uh, right. First matches on Friday. The temperature should be 99 degrees. That means on court, it'll be about 110. Okay. Somehow we're missing that. Like it was supposed to get really hot here, but now yeah. the forecast is in the high 80s for the next several days. After oh, wow. Yeah. Well, you know, Macon, Macon but is Macon's way over there in the frying pan. Yeah, it's yeah. the fall line. Right. So, right. yeah. Uh, um, let me see if it's changed. I hope it's changed for us because we had the coaches meeting last night and everybody I, was I was like, talking to my mom yesterday and in Austin, it's been like over 100 for like weeks now. Okay um oh yeah i saw dallas was was ripping it was like nine o'clock at night and it was still 100 degrees yeah just crazy it is supposed to hit 98 degrees today uh in macon wow and friday's 97 so it has dropped down two degrees um well i hope they keep everybody hosed down well somebody asked on the coaches meeting thing last night like you know are there any extra provisions for like heat stoppages and like all that kind of stuff and they were like i know that you're not going to want to hear this, but um, there's no such thing as a heat stoppage in tennis and you are playing tennis in South Georgia. That's where you live. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> and people, people were like, but some of these kids are 10 and, and she was like, well, if they can't do it, you'll have to tell them to forfeit. Um, oh, geez. I mean, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's it, like it, buck up little campers. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> And, you know, wow. we've been practicing every day for the past two weeks to get ready for the heat. And if you haven't been doing that, well, then, you know. Yeah, that's true. There's something to be said, said I guess, for that. Um, Come on. You remember puking through your uh, your face mask. Two days, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 And if, and if you drank water, you were some kind of wuss. Exactly. I mean, yeah. Yeah. You were made to run extra laps if you, if you wanted water outside of whatever little break you had. I, oh, my gosh. It's just amazing more kids did not get really really in a mess i, I know yeah I, I agree and i've asked I, this question all the time like why did we not die yeah and and the yeah. answer people have always given me is that our parents you know would put us outside and tell us to play outside and we were used to you know the the weather right uh, whereas today's kids are they don't do a lot of physical activity outside of the sports and they spend right. most of their time inside yeah, that's back in the good old days, uh, like Wobegon, you know. Oh, yeah. All the women are strong, the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so anyway, yeah. there is Hugh Bennett in the flesh. <laughs> Hi, Hugh, how are you? How are you? How you doing, Hi, man? Are you all right? We're doing okay. We're doing okay. I don't think you and Brian have ever met, or, or have you? No, I, I, I haven't. Remember. We haven't okay. met. Nice to meet you, Hugh. Good. Good to meet you, Brian. Good. I was I was expecting a, uh, a a you know a Welsh rugby star, but uh... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the alternative to me in the uh, yeah. Neck and yeah. <laughs> well, hey, I just uh, had had uh, WhatsApp with uh, our our friend of the pod, Dave Morgan Owen. Oh, okay. And, uh, uh, we he, we I wanted to do a uh, podcast dog update. And he said that Freddie's doing good, that Freddie is now into having his belly rubbed. Uh, so, you know, it's a whole new level of spoiled him uh, that he and Amy are, are imposing on, on that poor, poor animal. Uh, but, I, of course, I got to meet Freddie. You've met Freddie, right, Hugh? Right? Yeah, I've, I've, I met Freddie a few months ago uh, for the first time, uh, the only time. And uh, I'm one of those people who's pretty nervous around dogs. And uh, Freddie is enthusiastic, let's put it that way. <laughs> <You're> very. <laughs> He's a high-energy dog. Uh, I'm also a cat person, so there's that factor in there too. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So it took a little getting used to, but he's um, he's very good natured. Oh, he is, he, and he he's such a long, lanky thing. I mean, he's almost as big as Dave is. 
yeah. frankly. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, we saw him out uh, when we were over there at Oxford, you know, back in late May. Uh, Dave was kind enough to bring Freddie out to Blenheim. And, you know, we did a nice, nice big long walk out on the grounds at Blenheim Palace with Freddie on a nice, nice classic, you know, cloudy, windy, drizzly, you know, in- English day there in, in, in Oxfordshire. And it was it was wonderful. But Freddie was hilarious. It was just a riot. Uh, so it's good to find, finally get the medium. But anyway, on the whole, since Tucker's got an ear infection, but doing yeah. much better. You know, it's that summer, right, type thing. Yeah. But, but Bruno's hanging in there. Bruno's good. I, uh, I walked in this morning before we came over. Um, a morning walk uh, in South Georgia pretty much puts him out for about four hours. <laughs> so uh, he is... Uh, He's he's laying on the hardwood floor trying to cool down right now. Yeah, good for him. Good for yeah. him. Yeah. Well, Hugh, man, hey, thanks for taking the time today. We really appreciate it, and and you know it's good to find finally get you on and everything. Uh, so, uh, Brian, why don't you go ahead and introduce introduce our man? I will, and I'm really really excited about getting to do some pronunciations here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, today we are with Hugh Bennett. Hugh is a reader in international relations in the School of Law and Politics at Cardiff University in Wales. He was previously a reader and then lecturer in international politics and intelligence studies at, here we go, Aberystwyth University, (laughs) and a lecturer in defense studies at King's College London at the Joint Services Command and Staff College. He was educated at the University of Wales, Aberystwyth, having earned a degree in international politics and strategic studies, a master's in strategic studies, and then finally a PhD in international politics. He was written two books, the first, Fighting the Mau Mau, the British and the Counterinsurgency in the Kenya Emergency, was published by Cambridge in 2012. And his most recent book, Uncivil War, the British Army and the Troubles, 1966 through 1975, will be released by Cambridge in October 2023. He was also co-edited the Kenya Papers of General Sir George Erskine, June 1953 to May 1955. I did that one with friend of the pod, David French. Um, And his articles have been published in War and History, Journal of Strategic Studies, Journal of Imperial and Commonwealth History, and Defense and Security Analysis, just to name a few. His work has been supported with research funding from the British Academy. I always mess mess this one up. The Labour Hume, is that it? I'll say it. Yeah. Good, good enough. Uh, Labor Hume Trust, the Irish Research Council, and the Economic and Social Research Council. Hugh's involvement in the profession is considerable. He is a member of the editorial board at the British Journal for Military History, also at Studies in Contemporary Warfare and War in the British Empire. He is also the co-editor-in-chief at Critical Military Studies. He's a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and the Higher Education Academy, and he has appeared on BBC World News, Good Evening Wales, Radio France International, and many others. Welcome, Hugh. It's a pleasure to meet you. So pleased to be here. I've, I'm yeah. such a fan of the podcast. Uh, I was trying to think, why do I like it? And I, I like the podcast because you bring military historians together in a way that's obviously so important since the pandemic, but yeah. also you kind of lift the lid the people who like military history but maybe don't do it themselves to see you know what it's actually like the kind of the mess you know behind the yeah. walls so um yeah to demystify the whole process right because yeah we're just normal people as well yeah we just we want to pull back the curtain <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh hugh uh let's start with uh with where you're from what your parents did uh you know how'd you get into military history and then i have a special question for you um what do you consider yourself um and what i mean by that is are you a historian a political scientist or both yeah that's a that's something i always have to justify and um i was listening to your uh recording with uh, with evan wilson at the at the mm-hmm. Naval war college and his comments about professional military education being you know a um, supportive place in American academia in the last few years. And that's how it looks like going for the future as well, because, you know, the job market and so on. And I think, you know, for me, this is um, this is why I'm a reader in international relations is because in the UK context, there's been quite a lot of growth in, in politics and, and IR departments over the last couple of decades where history departments have maybe struggled a little bit more. So it's kind of a um, a career, a cynical career move um, gotcha. in one way. Um, all of my education is was in politics, in a politics department. 
uh, but I was taught by a lot of historians. So I'm I'm not officially a historian. I don't have any hi historical degrees or training or anything. I'm in the his I'm in the Royal Historical Society. That's as right. As good right. As my, That's my as good school. as it gets, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's um so it's a it's a kind of a um, a cynical career move. Yeah, that's to answer that question first. Well, it's funny how we how we label, you know, we, we've yeah. talked about this before. And, and, you know, the summer seminar, you know, in New Orleans, Brian, we we actually spent a morning session talking about how do we label, you know, military history versus war and society. Right. And all that. And why do we do this? Right. But it's just part of our our business that, that you're you're conditioned to, I think, in a very early place in graduate studies that you need to label yourself in order to market yourself right yeah yeah or something mm -hmm. like that so you know I, just... I, I think one of the advantages of coming from um international relations like a lot of a lot of historians are antagonistic towards ir but um i see its advantages is yeah. that you know many people in ir recognize that it's not really a proper discipline in that it doesn't have its own kind of yeah. really strict boundaries it's a polygon it, um, yeah yeah, it just it steals from everywhere. Right. So if you're kind of f happy with that idea that you don't really belong to any particular discipline and you can you can flex and you can move your interest as time goes on, then to, I, I just find that a good thing. You know, that's that's great because I'm not stuck in the same area forever. I can decide to be interested in new stuff. Yeah, I yeah. love he used a great word. He could flex. Flex, yeah. Flex, yeah. We um, a quick question before we we get into your background. So uh, I just had a, a former student come and uh, and and visit me the other day. He just did a master's degree in international relations at American University in D.C. And um, he, you know, Americans got a good a good program. And and he just kind of thought, well, you know, I'll get a job in the D.C. scene when I get done with my degree there. And what he found is that if you don't have a foot in the door with the federal system in the United States, you basically aren't getting a job. Um, mm -hmm. So if you were in the army, for example, or even if you were, um, you know, in uh, a post postman, um, you you get automatic uh, priority for those positions. Um, is that the case in the UK as well? Is there kind of a, a feeder where if you've done some kind of other government service, you you have a leg up? I don't think so. Not officially. So, I mean, of course, there's there's two things in the UK. There's the official meritocracy where um, people can apply to the civil service and then, you know, choose which department to go in. And they have fast stream tracks for people who are very high achieving. Um, and there's, you know, a long history of people from like really diverse backgrounds getting into the civil service and doing well out of yeah. that. And then there's the class system and there's Oxford and Cambridge. And there's people having, you know, social ties and yeah. daddy used to work in the foreign office and this kind of thing, which still plays quite a big part in gotcha. how people. And so it's not um, having any kind of official connection to the state, but it's more um, those those social networks gotcha. uh, unofficially. Right. When we have Matthew Ford on, Brian, what we need to ask him that question, because that, he'll go off for like 30 minutes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all <of> that. <laughs> so, I mean, that brings that brings us back to my um, my background because yes, I'm, I'm I'm from a place yeah. where I should have become one of those Oxford or Cambridge people because I'm mm. from um, Surrey. Surrey is like the most sort of elitist um, home counties departments uh, uh, county south of, uh, of London. It's like commuter territory. Every, everybody drains out of the town and goes up to London in the week. There's only anybody around at the weekend. You know, it's one of those kind of places. And, and um, yeah, and it's very kind of um, wealthy and, and, and prosperous. So um, that's where I was brought up. And my, my dad worked for British Rail, as it was when it was still a nationalised industry. He was, um, he was a manager. He was put in charge of um, privatising British Rail and he did such a good job that his reward was that he was sacked. <laughs> oh, uh... <laughs> yeah. So he had a few years out of the out of the system, and then I think his his lifetime, um, you know, favorite moment of his life was when they begged him to come back a few years later, and uh, the system was kind of struggling because there'd been a, an exodus of like a whole generation of people who'd been kicked out, so that the railway could be run by bankers and. You know, people who knew nothing about it, and uh, 
and they realized they needed to bring these kind of old old guys back <laughs> who actually knew yeah. what they were doing so um he he agreed at a you know exorbitant consultant's uh, salary and um so he triumphed over the in the end and was uh, thrilled about that and my mum was a, a french teacher oh who, yeah so she tried to drill into me and my sister uh, French language from a young age. So of course I decided to learn German instead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> married to a German and going to Germany in a few weeks time. So uh, <laughs> managed to resist that. And, um, and then, yeah, so that's where I was brought up. And as a reaction against it, I, um, decided to go to university somewhere that was, um, seven or eight hours away on the train. Um, the other, the other end of the country, Aberystwyth is a very kind of remote place. It's on the coast of West Wales, and uh, it's it's somewhere where you can go and be away from your family and and reinvent yourself and and create a new life for yourself. And uh, and the reason I ended up there was because um, the year I wanted to go, I, I did want to do history. My my dad had studied history, so we always talked about history at home. Um, history then was the most popular degree for anybody who was going to go to university. Wow. And my and my predicted grades were really bad. <laughs> so I, was, I was not going to get in anywhere good for history. Well, you're in good company on this podcast. Let me tell yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. Been there. <laughs> yeah, late bloomers. I'm, yep. I'm in the late bloomer category for sure. So, um, so we did some digging, and my dad came back with some, you know, prospectuses uh, from the library before the days of the internet really being used much. And uh, and the prospectus from Aberystwyth, it had this page with this program called Strategic Studies, and there was a picture of a tank. That, that was it. <laughs> that's all you needed. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all I needed. So that was that was um, a decisive factor. And then we went for an open day in Aberystwyth, and they're very cunning because they they put in the program this um, like fifteen minute, twenty minute informal chat, and um, and it turned out it wasn't an informal chat it was an interview but they'd oh, kind wow. of hidden in the in the agenda and um and the person that i was having the chat with uh later on would be my phd supervisor colin mckinnis and uh i just finished reading a, a week or so before um the first day on the Somme by martin middlebrook mm -hmm. oh so yeah we, had, we just had a 20 minute conversation about the battle of the Somme and you know the the role of strategy versus the social composition of the army and the role of artillery and the German defenses and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So um, it was, it was just bliss, you know, I just, just sucked me in straight away. Wow. Is this what I could actually do for three years? Talk about things like this. So, yeah. So when you, when you went to Wales, I mean, I've, I've never been, um, obviously you can do everything in, in English there, but do you, do you hear people speaking Welsh on the street on a daily basis? Yeah, you do. It depends upon um, the part of Wales that you're in. So w where I am now in Cardiff, there's not a very high proportion of Welsh speakers. Okay. Um, my, my children at, at primary school, they um, have a couple of hours of Welsh each week. So there is some kind of effort to, um, to convey the Welsh language. Um, and then there's kind of Welsh cultural events as well. In, in Aberystwyth, there's probably like, I don't know, 30 or 40% of the population speak Welsh. Okay. So certain pubs and certain shops in the town where if you go in there and don't speak Welsh, it's a problem. Right. Oh, wow. Okay. You will be, you'll be looked at as being kind of disrespectful, you know, for not trying, trying to do it. Yeah. yeah if, if you don't even know a couple of words. So Aberystwyth is a very strong Welsh speaking place. And um, it's really, it's very bilingual. The university there as well was, was really strict on, um, you know, all publications have to be in Welsh first and then English after. If you're sending out emails to like groups of more than a couple of people, then you have to get the email translated and put into Welsh. So, you know, you were respecting the Welsh speakers and um, and like a lot of the modules, they had kind of shadow uh, double modules, you know, as a Welsh version and an English version. So people could, you know, do a whole degree through the medium of Welsh. Wow. Okay. That's, that's really, uh, that's pretty fascinating. I didn't realize that, uh, there was that much. I mean, I, I understand it, you know, they want to maintain, yeah. um, the, the language and I mean, it's, it's kind of like, uh, RMC in Kingston, you know, they, they have to do, I think everything either you know, in French and in English mm -hmm. in, in Canada, you know, in Canada, Royal Military mm -hmm. College. I mean, they, that, I think they still do that. 
um, mm. because of the yeah. Quebec, Quebecois. So I mean, it, it's a fairly recent development. Like, so yeah. my my mum's Welsh, and she's from South Wales, uh, from the Valleys, which is a less Welsh speaking place. But um, when she, she, you know, when she was young, Welsh was it was not it didn't have an official status as it does now. Right. There was no Welsh language act, which came about um, in the in the 60s or 70s, um, which you know gave it this kind of protected status. So, there, you know, from from a Welsh nationalist perspective, the English had kind of tried to destroy the culture and destroy the yeah. language. And it's right. been kind of a long campaign and struggle to rebuild that. Um, and now when I go to Northern Ireland, you know, and speak to people from the nationalist community in Northern Ireland, they're very interested in the Welsh rights and the mm. Welsh schemes that are used to kind of promote the language because they, they'd like to have that same kind of status as well. Well, yeah, I just kind of assumed uh, based on where you were educated that you that you were Welsh. Um, and so one of my questions was going to be, you know, you you look at. Um, you know, these populations that have been treated very badly by the British, did that have any impact on you, uh, you know, in terms of what you wanted to study? And with your mom being Welsh, uh, I guess the, the question is still valid. I mean, did you know your identity? Did, did you ever feel like an outsider, I guess I should say, like being Welsh? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, something about being uh, brought up in the home counties, like the most English place in England uh, with a Welsh first name, you know, this is a, a thing that attracted um, people at school, right? They picked yeah. up on it and you know, they find things that rhyme with you. So, <laughs> um, oh, classic. You know, you know, I've, always, I've always felt more kind of British rather than English or Welsh. I, I, yeah. you know, I'm both. I'm English and Welsh. Yeah, in in Wales, I think that's one of the things that attracted me about um, about the country, and also about um, uh, when I went there to study about Aberystwyth, was it did have a reputation as being quite a radical place. It would encourage, you know, kind of alternative ways of looking at the world. So one of the one of the um, kind of fields of study that was really flourishing when I went there in the late nineties, that had been kind of going since the perhaps the late eighties, was critical security studies. Right. So trying to move away from the state as the kind of defining object of uh, subjects of analysis and instead look at you know human rights and, and individuals and uh, and things like this. So there was a very like critical alternative atmosphere throughout all of my years in Aberystwyth. Um, I did live with some German anarchists for a year or two as well, <laughs> which was quite a amusing experience there wasn't there wasn't that much work getting done but there was a lot of arguing and debating and um this was all going on at a time of you know um kosovo and then the invasion of iraq and 9 11 and you know these kinds of world events so yeah it was very uh, politically fertile yeah. Right, I'm I'm picturing the guys from from Autobahn and and the Big Lebowski, but they were nihilists. They weren't anarchists. They were nihilists. Yeah. They were, they were nihilists. Much worse. Yeah, they did. <laughs> yeah, so exhausting. <laughs> you know the the problem with the anarchist, and this holds for the German anarchist and all anarchists, is that they just they're really disorganized. Uh, right. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I tell my students that joke every single semester, and they just look at me like you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, Hugh, how then did you get interested in 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 the Mau Mau specifically, but also just really getting into colonial violence or regular warfare? And of mm -hmm. course, you know, of course, that leads to atrocity because they, they, unfortunately that all seems to go hand in hand uh, mm -hmm. how, how did that come about well I, it was a gradual process right this it didn't occur to me overnight sure. and it was definitely um influenced by the war in iraq like this was a big a big thing that was going on in the background and thinking about parallels but where i'd come from you know i'd come from surrey and I'd also come from, you know, being immersed in mainstream UK culture in the 80s and the 90s growing up, which was a place that was fascinated by the First World War, by the Second World War. Uh, and my first kind of awareness of, of war and the military was talking to my grandmother. She was a teenager. She was like 15, 16 at the beginning of the Second World War. She had a great Second World War. You know, she... she there were some tragedies, like she had some boyfriends who were, you know, killed in tanks in North, in North Africa and, and so on. Um, but she 
found it very socially liberating. You know, she was out on the town in London and meeting all these people. She was doing things that she would never have been able to do otherwise because she, um, just before the war, had been in domestic service, mm. right? So there's just, <laughs> it's just a very restricted uh, life that was kind of, you know, planned out for her. And then the war came along and, and this changed everything. So we would talk about her, her wartime experience. We would go up to the Imperial War Museum. This was a very kind mm -hmm. of formative place as well. Um, then when I was a teenager, when I was 16, as a reward from my parents for not failing my GCSE exams, <laughs> um, the two of us went on a um, on a coach tour on a, a Holt, you know, the Holt company, Major and Mrs. Holt, one of the classic companies to um to Ypres and to the Somme and uh and this this had a huge effect on me as, uh, as well but so it gave me this kind of brought up my my interest in war but it also gave me this idea of war as um something based around heroism you know the good war of the second world war the defeat of nazism and that this was like a uh, an important feature of British national life that British people should be proud of, right? So th this is what I was thinking when I went off to university and was 18 and wanted to learn more about, you know, tank tactics and strategic bombing and stuff like this. And then gradually as I, you know, I was moving moving through, I think t the two things, first of all, my interest was was not in colonial, it was in guerrilla, guerrilla warfare. And the connection between guerrilla warfare and atrocity, you know, is very clear. Okay, yeah. this, this fundamental problem for the for the counter guerrilla forces of how do you find the, the guerrilla without harming the civilian population, right? So I did my dissertation, my master's dissertation on the German army on the Eastern Front in the Second World War and the counter guerrilla campaigns and the relationship between that and the Holocaust. Because it's not there, as you know, you know, it's not a clear boundary between the two, and a lot of the violence that was going on was was ideological, and it was it was not about finding the gorilla; it was just about hurting the population. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so this was also the first time I got into the archives because I I, I discovered that the um, the full transcript, like hundreds and hundreds of pages of the court martial of field marshal uh, von Manstein, who'd been a key commander on the Eastern Front, very successful um, mm -hmm. you know, general. Uh, his court martial records were in the National Archives in, in Kew because he'd been tried at the end of the war by the British. He'd, he'd yeah. fallen in British hands. Um, so this, you know, I tried to feed that into my dissertation. It didn't all work out perfectly, but it gave me a real hunger for archives, this, this proximity to the source material. And this feeling of sort of uh, an ability to understand why people were making these crazy, incredible decisions. That's what took me into the, the sort of moving into the PhD years. I had this idea of this, this thing about guerrilla warfare or, you know, counterinsurgency, as we're now starting to call it, and finding the finding the people who are guilty and separating them from the innocent. And at that time, most of the literature, most of the academic literature said, the only people who solve this problem are the British Army. Like every other army in the history of warfare has got this wrong and they ended up hurting innocent people. And it's all about Vietnam and the French in Indochina and so on. But the British have got this magic medicine called hearts and minds and, and another one called minimum force. And they can always get this right. So it struck me that there's something wrong with, with this idea. Like this is not convincing. And when you look, when you dig, when you dug into the literature, what you found was there just there wasn't that much archive depth, right? So it was it was a field that was kind of ripe for getting into the archives and looking at that again to see if it was true or not. Yeah, and you're bound to make some people angry when you start asking those kinds of questions. Yeah, I mean, this is why the question was being asked by me in Aberystwyth and not by people working at King's College London, mm -hmm. you know, who I've also worked for is a great institution, but it's quite close um, psychologically as well as, you know, in physical distance terms to the defence ministry and why it was not really being asked by people at Oxbridge either. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's it for sure it's a weakness of my work as well. Like a major weakness is I don't do a lot of interviewing 
I don't know a lot of ex-military people and have the, those really close relationships, but it's also been an asset because it's allowed me to be a little bit more distanced emotionally in choosing like what are the right questions to ask here yeah yeah you you, you probably know i, I mean I, i've done work on atrocities in vietnam i wrote a book on my Lai, and you know the, the work you've done mal mal etc um i know i i don't want i, I want to ask you this and it's 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 really I, I think a really sincere question and i hope you'll be open about it and, and i'll be open about my experience uh I mentally, I mentally and emotionally struggled writing that book on Milai. I mean, the more I got into it, and, and as the months went by, researching and everything, I mean, I, I really, it, it took, a, it took me about a year to decompress from that after I was done from that project. Did you experience similar things? I, I mean, whatever you're open and talking about with that. Yeah, no, I did for sure. Um, there was a period, there was a period when I did my uh, PhD on Kenya where it was the progress that I was making in the archives and the things I was writing about was going on at the same time as there were atrocity allegations about the British army in Iraq. Right. right. The most right. famous example of this was the, the murder of Baha Musa, who was a hotel receptionist in, in Basra, who mm -hmm. was captured. He was suspected of being connected to insurgents. He wasn't. And he was basically uh, kicked to death. Right. So there was, a lot of um, publicity and, and press interest um, in this case. So yeah, there came a time where I had I was told to go on holiday by the GP basically because it was all becoming yeah. too much. And I think a part of that, you know, on one level, of course, it's just the horror of reading accounts of torture, um, of, of human rights violations, of, of people doing horrible, disgusting things. But it's also, I think, psychologically, as as the writer, the burden that you take on yourself of feeling, I have to explain this clearly, and also I have to hold people to account in a way that is reasonable and not seen as sort of really morally judgmental, right? Yes. yes. Because because what I what I personally do object to, and what I think is a kind of a cop out is um is accounts of atrocity or you know this, this is the same issue that's arisen for me writing about bloody sunday in northern ireland which are very just kind of descriptive and set out what happened and then they leave it and move on right i think you know the description is the foundation there has to be a very clear sense for the reader of the sequence of of, of how things panned out and, and and what was going on so they can understand it because often atrocities are, are very confusing, right? Very mm -hmm. complicated sequence yeah. of events. But then, you know, as a, and maybe this is my sort of political science background as well. I want to know, like, what are the political implications of this? Because if you study warfare for any period of time, it's obviously the case the atrocities in war cannot be eliminated right this is just a right. recurring yeah. feature of any war but i think it's it's not sufficient to say it's a recurring feature of war so we'll just mention the atrocity and then move on to the next thing right yeah this is something as well that i got to understand a lot better working in in pme and talking to serving military officers is that they actually do want to know how to stop atrocities from happening right these yes. are serious people. Yeah. And and the the alternative to, to kind of just describing an atrocity and then as a writer kind of walking away from it before getting to the accountability question is is to be very is to basically assume that everyone in the military is evil yeah. and that they're you know, they're just going to do these things inevitably because they're bad people. And if you spend any time with the military, you know that that's just not true and that the military is just like society in general in that there's some good guys and some bad guys and it's complicated and it's messy and people are affected by the particular circumstances of you know what's going on on any particular day so um you know to me that that sort of that final question of um the so what like wh why did this happen and what was done afterwards to try and stop it from happening again that's something that's always motivated me but it's yeah, it feels like 
is quite a burden as well because you want to make sure that you get that right otherwise you're potentially holding the wrong people to account or you're going to be dismissed and then the whole episode won't be acknowledged in some way no i i found that i was very uh cognizant of of trying to do right by the victims Mm. but also by the the innocent you know like in my in, in the case i was looking at the the soldiers who were bystanders you know like like how do you deal with them you know there, there were only a handful that tried to stop that that incident at milai and and you know how do you how do you deal with all the ones that were were bystanders but you also don't want to just blanket blanketly accuse them of of being neglectful because there's different circumstances right it depends on where people were at at a given time and, and things like that. There's just all sorts of things. And, and I, I kind of got overwhelmed by all that a little bit. It, I just like, I was not totally prepared for that. You don't know, just, just emotionally, you know, just trying to, trying to wrestle with that. But yeah, it's tough. It's yeah, very, it's very it. overwhelming. And I think there's, you know, as in my experience and in the UK, like there's no training for it and there's yeah. no, but I don't know how you could train for it or how you could prepare for it. As you were saying, like, as I've gone on, and and this is perhaps more the case with the Northern Ireland book than than I realised with the Kenya project, is I found it interesting to think about those um, people around the perpetrators, Mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, we know that in, we know that, like, Marshall's study of, you know, fire rates and whatnot are are not correct. But, But the general point that, in in the military it's only probably a a small proportion of people who do the actual killing right or right there's a small minority who are very active uh and others are are less so to varying degrees right so it's perhaps more interesting to step away from the people at the sharp end and to look at those around them so with this uh incident in in basra with bahamusa you know um the the padre came in and saw what was happening um and didn't do very much and in the end the the abuse was stopped by some pretty junior warrant officers like some ncos who came in and said this is just not acceptable we will not have this and they they managed to get it stopped you know and so rank is not a predictor necessarily right Right. yeah um and then in in the northern ireland context what i tried to do with um not bloody sunday but some other controversial shooting incidents was to say um so here's a shooting incident where where these soldiers like opened fire on someone uh where there was no firing going on around them at the time like there was no immediate provocation and then on this in the same couple of days here's another battalion that was in the same city roughly in the same kind of area and they were fired on like they took casual actual fatalities and they didn't return fire and they didn't return fire because they couldn't identify a target. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that you can you can compare it. So what it allows the the reader to see is like there are choices being made by individuals and by commanders here, and that these kinds of you know whether they're atrocities or, or shootings or however you want to describe them, they're not inevitable because there there are different kind of um, leadership cultures or different kind of disciplinary expectations depending upon even. Pl- Tunes, right, or, or companies, let alone regiments. So, real quick, we need we'll take a short break here in a sec. But I want to ask you about, you know, you, you've served as an expert expert witness a, a couple of times. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, what happened with the, the first time that I, that I did this was when I was this is when I was working at the Staff College in the UK for King's College London, and um, I was I'd finished my PhD and I was converting my PhD you know, into a book very slowly on Kenya and this court case uh, came up of um, a number of Kenyan uh, veterans, number of Kenyan civilians who were taking the British government to the high court for torture during the conflict in the 1950s. And uh, and I had a phone call from David Anderson, who uh, was then the professor of African history at Oxford and who I, I'd met when I was doing my PhD a couple of times. So we knew each other. And he was advising on this case along with Caroline Elkins at Harvard. And uh, he said the lawyers really need a, an army expert because the abuses that were going on were not 
entirely committed by like the colonial service or or the police there was some kind of military involvement but they don't really understand the chain of command and the accountability for that and like how they fitted into the political arrangements and so on um so can you get involved and um I, I was very lucky because my head of department at the staff college said go for it right you should do this this is an yeah. important service to um to to historical understanding and you know i was junior at that time you know i was a i was a junior lecturer and i i, I was worried like am i going to get in trouble here because this is clearly right. not this is not going to look good for the british army yeah. and this is not going to look good for the british government it's against the British government in court. So, you know, if he'd shut me down, then that probably would have been it. But Matthew Utley is his name. He he was really uh, exercised superb moral leadership there, I think, and said, and said, go for it. So yeah, I got involved. And um, basically, that involved me kind of translating my PhD findings for the court. And then um, it was discovered that the Foreign Office had a secret archive um and there were tens of thousands of files um which were released to us the experts and the lawyers we got to see them all first before they went to the national archives we got like a, a couple of years head start and um so we had access to that and i had to go through sort of thousands and thousands of pages of stuff to try and find new material and there was there was a lot of new material especially intelligence records and the intelligence records showed that the army was deeply, deeply involved. involved. So yeah. the way that I tried to see it and that I've tried to see like subsequent uh, involvement in these things is that my job there is to advise the court, right? Mm -hmm. I may have been engaged by the claimants who, you know, are claiming something happened to them. But what I'm actually writing a, a report for is is the judge, you know, it's it's for them to decide is this claim uh, uh, truthful? You know, does the evidence support it or not? That's not up to me. All I have to say is this is what the archive says. Right. And this is my expert interpretation of the archive. And then and then leave it to them. Because the legal the legal interpretation of documents is not the same as the historical one. Right. right. We, we sure. had a lot of conversations about this with these kind of really high powered London barristers, you know, being paid like <laughs> in, in, in order, like, you know, they're, they're, I, we talk about a report, and they'd say, "Now, you've you've said here, Hugh, you've said that this document suggests." Yeah, we don't like suggest. Yeah. It either it's either a fact or it's not a fact. <laughs> so, yeah, they have this very kind of positivist understanding of knowledge. Like it, it it's true or it's false. You know, yeah. there's no there's right. no gray zone, right. and that's pretty uncomfortable for a historian. So you have to work your way into their way of thinking well that's why they have country homes in surrey uh, you know yes yeah, you know. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, after after the trial you got a you found a suit that they had purchased you there they felt so bad for the historian <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> wearing a wearing a suit from marks and spencer yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man so we, let's take a little break All right, Hugh, we're gonna we're gonna stick uh, kind of in in the you know not present. Well, yeah, I'm gonna stick in the present right now because you know as historians, um, our value is 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 a little bit is somewhat limited when it comes to um, contemporary events. But uh, with what you do, you you are really an adept commentator on what's going on in the world right now. And so, um, what do the British, in your opinion? see as the biggest military threat facing the UK right now? Oh, well, that is a timely question because we've just had a defense command paper published uh, yesterday. No, oh. two days ago, sorry. Really? Okay. And um, there's been, you know, as you'd expect, like varying reactions to it and some people like it and others have, have been unhappy because it doesn't say much about mass you know, and the, the one of the biggest lessons from uh, the war in Ukraine is that you need numbers uh, of personnel and um, artillery pieces and tanks and so on 
and the the British army has been just shrinking for the last uh, number of years and something needs to be done about that so which is financially not um not doable right now it seems so yeah I think um there's a lot of focus on Russia um and the debate here about China seems to have kind of calm down over the last year i think there's um there's perhaps less worry that china's gonna do anything over well China. Kiss, kissinger's over there right now it's all gonna be fine yeah it's all gonna be it's fine all gonna be good it's henry, all gonna be good yeah because exactly. henry's all uh, able to stabilize everything um unless you live in certain parts of latin america but so i think i think really russia but you know one of the reasons that the uk can afford to have a pretty small army at the moment is because um, the prospect of Russia invading, you know, Britain is is tiny. It's not going right. to happen. And despite a lot of the talk about being a, a kind of a benchmark army and providing a divisional level force to NATO, though, the UK has been for some time and can continue to be uh, just reliant upon others to provide security for us, you know, primarily the US, of course, but also European allies. So a lot of the kind of resistance against building up the size of the British army has been from people saying, well, we don't need to do that anymore because the Polish are massively expanding and, you know, a number of of other European forces, the Germans are rearming on a big scale. So so we don't need to bother anymore because they'll do all that sort of stuff instead of us. So I think, you know, there there is no kind of imminent threat to UK security. And and the re- the real problems up with British defence are about getting the resources that are necessary to have a, a sustainable military. There's just more people leaving the military than there are joining. For example, you know the pay yeah. offer is just not good enough. The housing conditions. This is something that has been improved in the white paper that came out this week. Like there's going to be a major investment in the housing, but the the housing is appalling. Really dire conditions because it was privatized another thing oh yeah oh geez right Um, we're doing that too uh, yeah yeah so yeah so i think in a way you know britain's the kind of biggest threat to um britain's security at the moment is the kind of coherence of its own defense policy internally rather than than anything coming from from outside Hmm. do you think one service is is in better shape than than the others or is that an issue yeah i think that the the general view is that the navy is doing fairly well at the moment um uh, perhaps because of the chief the defense staff is an admiral so you know he looks after his his interests. yeah and there's a couple of aircraft carriers you know that have, have recently arrived and they're right. gigantic and prestigious and costs lots of money and it's exciting to sail them around no doubt so the navy's doing fairly well there's a shipbuilding strategy as well to kind of reconstitute the 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 less glamorous uh, types of battleships as, as well um and the, and the air force i think is is doing fairly well they've, they've had a scandal as well themselves recently over training and recruitment um discriminating against people uh. but, but i think probably the army is in the most in the most parlous state um both for like personnel numbers and like the equipment program uh, is is very inefficient. Well, it's it's interesting, you know, here in the states, like the army, the, the army has has not met its recruiting numbers, you know, monthly for for a long time now, and it's becoming a problem. And of course, it's become politicized. Whereas one side wants to say it's because of well, it's all it's because of all the woke training and everything that's turning people off and all that. But the surveys apparently show that no that's actually a very small percentage of people who don't want to join or whatever it's mainly because of cost Uh, um, they can get paid better doing a tech job in the private sector yeah you know the 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 military just can't compete as far as pay and advancement and, and things like that and you know but but it but it also i'm sure like there in the uk it's it's also become highly politicized which mm. makes it more difficult to get at what the root problems are and how to address them. Right. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think it, it's, it's primarily about the labor market, right. And the right. fact um, there's just, you know, uh, a lot of attractive employer employers that are, are, are bringing people in instead of into the military. So in a sense, like maybe in the U S as well as the UK, like the best friend 
the best friends of the defense ministries are the central banks, which are, are you know, deliberately trying to create a recession <laughs> by hiking up interest rates. So, you know, the soon because that's what happens, right? As soon as you get a recession, then military rec- recruitment becomes easier. Yeah. Um, because it, it's a, it's a more appealing offer for people who don't have anything else that they can do to earn money. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and, you know, the same thing in the U.S., at least um, our enrollment numbers go up considerably in the United States when there's a recession, uh, because when yeah. people can't can't get a job, then they say, OK, well, I'll go back and, you know, I'll finish school or I'll do whatever. And so, uh, yeah, for us, it's this like, you know, when when the economy is good and there's there's money, we don't have students. Um, when the economy is bad and we have no money, then we've got students who actually want to come to university. <laughs> so yeah. it's a it's a tough situation. It's a bizarre deal. It is a bar- bizarre deal. I well, think I think the issue for the UK for the for the British Army in particular at the moment is the question of like um, how bad are things going to get before there's a, a kind of a wake up um, moment and a realization that more money from the treasury is going to be needed. Right. So there's a discussion at the moment, for example, about the fact that in theory the British can provide a division uh, and in practice the British probably can't provide a division and um, there's there's a pretty high risk that some of the senior NATO you know command appointments and staff appointments are going to be taken off the UK because the UK is just not pulling its weight it. and you know if you've got a really serious large size Polish army with all these South Korean tanks like why shouldn't they be the deputy Sakya why shouldn't they take over the Allied Rapid Reaction Corps, things like this? And there are people in the UK defence debate who are saying, yeah, great, you know, let them have it. But I think for Britain's status and, and self, you know, image as, as a, a regional power or a great power, of a, a member of the UN Security Council, like having these very senior NATO posts taken away is going to be the shock that will perhaps yeah. lead to some change in the investment. Well, Hugh, let's shift gears a little bit. And let's talk about your 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 new book. Now, is 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 this already out? At fifth of October. Okay. For some reason, I thought I know I've pre ordered it on on Amazon. I think maybe that's where I saw it. And oh, I thank you very and, much. When I had clicked, I was like, "Hey, <laughs> got to get that." So, so I'll be it surprised. Due, it was due to come out earlier. Yeah. I think this, this um something has happened with the publisher. They, I'm not entirely clear what's happened. But they've had an internal meeting and decided that maybe they could sell a few copies after all. Oh. So they decided to move it out of the summertime kind of dead period. Gotcha. And um, apparently this new October phase is like the high sale yeah. to Christmas. So, right. Because who doesn't want the British Army in, in, in Northern Ireland uh, for Christmas? Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, put it, it on your list, on the beach, right? It's, right? I'd say it's more Christmassy than beach-like. Yeah, so, sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> You know, first of all, you know, we know just generally what what got you interested in this, but but we're also interested in uh, kind of like myself uh, doing Vietnam. You know, the the the, lot of the people are still around, and it and it's still uh, you know like Vietnam. You know, Britain, Northern Ireland, the Troubles. It, it's still a raw thing. Uh, it, that that scab's not very thick. It doesn't take much to peel peel that off, right? And and get get people worked up again. Um, I often tease Brian. I was like, he's lucky. Everybody he deals with is dead. Yeah. Uh, and, and sometimes there's benefit to that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, but seriously, uh, you know, one, how, how'd you get interested in it? But two, how, how, how have you dealt with just the fact that it is still a very raw topic? Mm. When I did my PhD, I was, you know, interested in this question of finding the insurgents without harming the population. And my supervisor said, you know, there's a load of different uh, case studies you could pick. You could do a few case studies. You could focus on one conflict. Do whatever you want, Hugh, but don't do Northern Ireland. So <laughs> I remembered that. And at, at the time, I thought, was, this is a bit odd. What, like, why not? This is a very big war that's been going on for a long time. And then a, about a year into doing the Northern Ireland project, it, I kind of realized, like, ah, oh, yeah, I see. Now I see why because it's controversial, but also because it, it's so complicated yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, sure, yeah. and, and yeah. difficult to, to kind of get your head around. So I can imagine that doing it as a PhD would have been a disaster. Um, but what I, I kind of built up to it slowly. So when I was at the staff college, I did a few articles on, on Northern Ireland. And this taught me the fact that there's a big gap in the literature, which is 
or has been on the army like there's a lot of stuff written about northern ireland it's, there's a huge literature most of it and the best stuff is on the ira right and it, it's on the, the terrorist groups and some of it is like quite strategically analytical as well there's no equivalent on the british army so um you know there's a gap in understanding and then i did a um I, I learned from David French, like David French was my PhD examiner, and then he's been a mentor since those days. I learned from David the, the art of like being exhaustive with the archive and, mm. and how to look at an archive catalogue and find opportunities. So I, I spent like weeks and weeks and weeks composing a document, which I still have and which I still update like 10 years later, called my Northern Ireland Research Strategy which I, I keep a list of all of the archive files. And there were just hun- thousands of, of archive files on this topic yeah. that had not been l- looked at by anybody. So the only question for me really was not like, sh- should I do Northern Ireland? It's how. Mm-hmm. How can I do this in a way that I'll survive and not <laughs> completely overwhelm myself? So it's, it started off being a book about um, up until 1979, and then a few years in, I decided to chop it back to 75 because it it was undoable for such a long period of time. And also for, there's argument reasons for that as well, which which we sh- could come on to. But um, yeah, so that's that's what got me interested. And at an early stage as well, talking to a few veterans. So uh, I talked to David Benest, who died uh, sadly a couple of years ago, who was um, he ended his career as a colonel in the parachute regiment. And he he uh, was very distinguished by his record in the Falklands War, um, but had also been at the beginning of his career as a junior officer in Northern Ireland. So when I started this project in Aberystwyth, he came into my office and we sat down for an hour and it was all off the record. Like he, he wouldn't have anything recorded, um, but he told me like what it was really like when these gun battles were going on on the streets of the UK, yeah. right? Like it's a crazy thing to get your head around. So um, yeah, talking to people like him had a had an influence on me. Um, but it but it also made me very aware from day one, that this was sensitive. And the interview route was probably not going to be open mm, to, some, yeah. to somebody like me, right? And uh, an outsider, with a track record of suing the British government for torture. Like, <laughs> so, yeah, there was that. Yeah. <laughs> there was that. So, yeah, I found out later, like wh- when I was doing the book, when I was going to archives and museums, um, I was told at one regimental museum that they you know, they, they were really helpful and they let me look at loads of papers. So at the end of the day, I asked the archivist, like, have you got a mailing list for your, you know, veterans from the regiment? And, you know, can I put a message out there to try and recruit people to interview and they laughed at me and they're like no 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 well (laughs) you can try but there's been an order gone out from regimental headquarters that veterans are not to talk to academics journalists or lawyers on anything to do with northern ireland doesn't matter what the question is doesn't matter what the project like just a murder these kinds of experiences kept cropping up when i was writing the book you know, intellectually, it's a shortcoming. You know, there's not a lot of, there's no interview material in there that I've done. I've used yeah. all histories from the Imperial War Museum, but so that's an opening for whoever comes next. Do you have a sense of what material that's still out there in archives at Q or whatever is still classified on all of this? Like what kind of percentage maybe? Yeah, there's um, there's known unknowns and unknown unknowns, right? right. So the, right. The, the archives that we don't know anything about them the the one of the great things about the q catalog is it's so systematic and it's so thorough so i have got another document that i've kept since the beginning of the project called closed and retained files Mm -hmm. and there are thousands of files where you can find the title and and the time frame and you know who created it what it's about so like northern ireland intelligence 1973 or whatever by the army and then it just says closed for like a hundred years or something. So there's there's a there's a lot of material that's definitely there that's shut. And then there's there are other archives from organisations who we know were active in the conflict, where they don't open any of their archives. And the and the main one here is MI5, right? So the mm-hmm. domestic 
yeah. a intelligence service. Um, and this this has got implications for for my for a real specific part of my analysis, which is about the loyalist terrorist groups. So those groups who are fighting not to get out of the UK, but to keep Northern Ireland in the UK. The main gathering intelligence agency on them was MI5, and all of the MI5 records are shut, and they will be for a very long time. Right. So there's there's still a lot that's closed, but it's amazing when you get into it, you know, as any intelligence historian will tell you, you start reading files that have got titles like, you know, things to do with, you know, supply and maintenance or food or whatever. Yeah. There's like intelligence records in there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're stuck in there. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's astonishing. And also a, a lot of the high level intelligence stuff has been released. So the, um, from uh, late 1971, the Ministry of Defence started producing monthly reports on operations and all of those monthly intelligence uh, reports from then until the end of 1975 are open. So it's it's quite surprising because maybe because they're in folders called like operations and, and, yeah. and they're not. They're not labeled as intelligence records, but they are definitely intelligence records. Yeah. And, that, and it could be as simple as that. I know we, we often, you know, we, we tell our students, you know, because they'll ask, well, you know, it's history. It never changes. And I was like, no, it changes all the time. And this is one reason why, because the history of this that's written 100 years from now, who knows, you know, what, yeah. what will be available by that time and, and, and things like that. Plus, you're, you're, you're farther enough away from it, whether it's not the emotional you know, and, and things like that. Um, you know, I, same thing with what I wonder about Vietnam. I just wonder what the history of the Vietnam War is going to be, you know, 50 years from now, yeah. especially once all the veterans are gone. Right. Uh, you know, that, that it's going to be, it, it will be different, I think, and hopefully better uh, and more yeah. honest because of that, because it's just hard. But I, I applaud you for taking on, you know, a topic that's still within living memory and so fresh and, and raw and, uh, I don't know about you, man, but every once in a while, I, I man, I'm going to join Brian in, in some somewhere where everybody's going. <laughs> it's I'm going you know, to go I, back I, to that. <laughs> I rarely run into problems. Um, Hugh, you mentioned your wife is German, so maybe you've uh, you've you've you're familiar with German archival law. I mean, the only problem I ever run into is that you'll go to order a file and and they'll say, "Oh, well, you have to get permission from the family." to mm. see this and you know i'm i'm in town for two weeks and and i say okay well you know what do i call them and they're like oh no no we send out this thing and you know they'll it'll probably be a couple months before <laughs> you get the response <laughs> and you're just kind of like oh um okay um but uh there there are workarounds to those things but um yeah i i very rarely have any kind of problems dealing with uh first world war stuff it's just german privacy law can be a bit tricky mm. because you know if That's i mention someone by name i can be sued by their descendants and uh apparently you know oh, germans wow. will, will do that so uh huh. yeah so like if you look at my my book uh i just call people you know a whatever um and and change the names so that you you can't trace who it is unless it's a, a public figure but um yeah i uh there was a um, um Adolf Heusinger, who was the uh, head of the German ar post post World War II German uh, army, um, he was a prisoner in the First World War and trying to get his files from the family. You know, they wanted to know exactly what was going to be done with it. Um, so, but but that's uh, you know, I'm lucky. That's that's the uh, extent of my problems. Well, I've had this same debate. Like I've I've tried to use the Freedom of Information Act a lot. And uh, it was easier and I was a lot more successful before the Conservative Party got into government, strangely enough. Like, yeah. Things changed from then onwards um, and partly because of resources. So like, if you go to the UK National Archives now, for example, you just see there's far fewer staff work there than mm. used to be the case. Yeah. So the whole thing is just uh, is a lot slower. So it's not all a, it's not all a big conspiracy. It's, you know, largely to do with money. Um, but, you know, I always put in my FOI claims, like, please redact names if you feel that is necessary. This is a study about strategy and policy. I don't care what the name of the lieutenant was. You know, it's not, it doesn't matter to me. Like, just put yeah. X, person X or whatever. Um, yeah. it's, it, it's not about singling people out uh, in that way. Um, all the senior people, you know, it's in living memory. 
but all the senior people like the prime ministers and the cabinet ministers and the heads of the army and whatnot they're all dead right so that the, there's no sensitivity about criticizing them and you know arguably even if they're alive you know they're fair game yeah. because they're they're senior um, right anyway what do you think brian let's do it rapid fire yeah i think i think i think he he deserves some some rapid fire treatment i, I think yeah. he's he's aren't here this has been great we really appreciate you yeah, taking the time and, and and also just being so uh you know upfront you know with 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 everything that we've talked about so this has been this has been fun so you've listened to these uh we do this rapid fire thing and and it's it's so misnamed but but it's all right we've, we've stuck <laughs> with it now for yeah. almost 70 episodes and and uh so what what we'll do is uh, we'll ask you a series of questions. Uh, Brian will ask a couple. I'll ask a couple. Uh, answer as best you can. And, and as you as you are well aware, we reserve the right to comment, yeah. comment and judge because it is our show. And of course, you know, yeah. we, we, we get to do that. So, so Brian, go. All right. Uh, I, I'm tapping into your Welsh heritage here. Best Tom, <laughs> best Tom Jones song. It's not unusual. Okay. Yeah. That just, yeah. That just That's, comes yeah. off yeah. the top yeah. of my head. Without yeah. <laughs> trying to think about it too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you get to listen to only one band or singer for the rest of your life. Who is it? Uh, I've been puzzling about this one because <laughs> this is hard. I could, to, to tell you the truth, I can go for like weeks or months and not listen to any music voluntarily. Like oh, I'll wow. listen to the radio if it's on or something, but yeah. like, not pick out an album or, you know, like make the effort. And then I can have periods where day after day i'm just repetitively listening to the same album again and again yeah yeah, so yeah. it can really vary and just i think purely for nostalgic reasons i pick nirvana oh, okay. okay yeah i like that yeah my, yeah my, my, my 90s upbringing <laughs> yeah yeah i that's... think that's i think that's our first nirvana shot yeah yeah sense, it is sense yeah. of kind of rebellion and and freedom and opportunity yeah yeah. Okay. Oh, I like Good it. One. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I like that. No, I know exactly what you mean. I, I go through that same phase. Well, I'll, I'll like on my drive, I'll listen to podcasts and stuff, and mm -hmm. then I'll go through like a month where I won't listen to any podcast, and I'll just be listening to music. And there's some yeah. days I'll listen to the same album over and over again on the three and a half hours. Yep. I did that with Stone Roses. Like I think toward the end of the semester, I don't know why, but I was just listening to that one Stone Roses album just over and over again. Right. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Very good. The thing, the thing that gets me through, if I'm stuck on on like writing, is mm -hmm. uh, drum and bass, drum and bass music. Uh, okay. Because of the energy and the speed of it, um, and it, yeah, it just switches switches something in my brain that gets the juices flowing if they're a little bit stuck. I like it. I good like deal. It. All right. Okay. Which superhero would you be? Oh man. Oh, I'm not a superhero person at all. I'm not like into the films or anything yeah we're not really either that's yeah that's, that's a good question <laughs> the only the only i don't know if these even count i just saw the adverts the other day when i was in the cinema for a uh, teenage <laughs> mutant ninja turtles hey I can't, i'll count that <laughs> yeah go for which, it which yeah. one <laughs> do you know uh, michelangelo <laughs> michelangelo okay all right no I, i'll i'll take that yeah yeah that absolutely no that's that's i like it i like yeah. it Okay, uh, speaking of the cinema, are you looking most forward to seeing Oppenheimer or Napoleon? Oh, what about Barbie? <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I've 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 seen only positive reviews for Barbie. Barbie, I know I, it's Barbie for me. I tell you what, the other week I listened, I I decided to mix up my normal podcast selection, and I listened to Dua Lipa interviewing Greta Gerwig uh, mm -hmm. last year. And Greta Gerwig sounds like a very interesting person to me. Uh, I like the idea of this Barbie film. It looks really tongue-in-cheek, tongue yeah, sure. um, funny. Margot Robbie, Ryan Gosling, they're, they're great actors. So, yeah, I'd go for Barbie. Okay, I, that's I, fair. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. do yeah. want to see yeah. Oppenheimer as well, but probably yeah. Barbie then Oppenheimer. I'll, yeah. I'll Oppenheimer. probably see all three of them. Oppenheimer yeah. does look really good. It does, I, I, yeah. It does look really good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The Napoleon thing is going to, it's already bringing all the Napoleon people out of the woodwork. Uh, yeah. poor, poor Zach White. It seems like every time he turns around, someone's pinging him <laughs> about, you know, the Napoleon film or whatever. But, 
Yeah, good. So, so you've been at see. I have I have not been in a theater to see a movie probably since 2019. I'm wow. thinking you're missing out. I've been yeah. in just this year actually. It was pre-COVID. I mean, pre-COVID. Yeah. That, that long. It's only it's only this year that my my daughters have decided that cinema is a fun thing to do. Okay. And, um, so we've been like three times, maybe yep. or four times this year. I've been to concerts uh, and stuff, but not. Just, just yeah, not I like I like the. It's a nice event, and um, yeah, I mean, the, the Little Mermaid is just not the same. It's not going to be the same <laughs> on the small screen. I can tell you, on the big screen, it's enchanting in a way that it could never be on a small screen. You talk about the the da- like I I have two daughters and I have I don't go to the cinema very often now but I remember like being there constantly when my kids were small like it was the era of Frozen um, oh, yeah. And, and yeah I mean <laughs> good lord I think we saw Frozen two or three times in the theater um, what do you mean the, what do you mean the era of Frozen the, it never, it's still there yeah it's still there <laughs> you, can, yeah. You, can never escape, you can never escape from the era of Frozen. <laughs> <laughs> all right oh, what man. what are you binge watching okay actually at the moment nothing um the i go through phases with binge watching as well uh, where it's like i don't really watch anything in particular or i really really binge watch to the point where i'm not getting very much work done and i have to give myself you know stern yeah. mirror um the thing that i nearly kind of binge watched but it wasn't that compelling recently was um beef about oh, yeah yeah is it set in la i think yeah people who get into a car crash and yep. then they become psychotically obsessed with each other <laughs> yeah yeah it's I watched hilarious. That. it was that was really amusing um but the thing that i've i've probably binged watch most enthusiastically in the last few years was um better call Saul. yeah oh yeah um yeah. yeah i was i was a real breaking bad fan mm. and i thought I came to think in, in some ways Better Call Saul was even at a higher level. A better, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Because of the, the slow burn of it. It's yeah. it's really the character development. Like, I like Ozarks as well. Oh, Ozarks. Oh, yeah, yeah, me too. Oh, I had to Oz- give up Ozarks. on Ozarks. It got too dark for me. I had to, I had it's to think. Dark. It, it's oh. dark. Ozarks is really strong on plot, plot development. Mm-hmm. Like, it's really interesting and it surprises you and so on. But the characters fundamentally don't change very much. Yeah. Whereas the Better Call Saul, like the, all of the the key protag- protagonists in it, as in Breaking Bad, like their their personalities shift over time as well, in in quite subtle ways that you know bounce off each other. So, yeah, those are probably my favourites. Okay, all right. What are you reading for pleasure? Oh, now I, I get the chance to sound very pretentious, and <laughs> this is not by design. This, <laughs> this is a follow-on from lockdown. One of the ways I got through lock, the first lockdown was I said I'm gonna um, I'm gonna read War and Peace because oh. I'm a military historian and I've never read War and Peace, and yeah. this shameful fact. Um, and also, it's something that is yeah immersive. You know, it's a it's yeah. an, an enormous experience that will take take over your life for like a whole year and it did take me a whole year to read it so i did that in lockdown so now i'm on anna karenina oh good Uh, okay all right yeah Yeah. i find it's you know it's not about war and it's a good distraction from otherwise i had uh, for for a long time i had just the really bad habit of reading war books all the time well that's that's why we asked the question that's why we asked the because we're we're the same way i mean i'm really i'm I'm reading billy Connolly's autobiography right now Mm. just because it's fun and it's inter- it's also very fascinating and it's not it's not Vietnam, yeah, <laughs> you know, which is good, right? We you need to break from it. So, yeah, very good. I like it. It's not pretentious. If you would have said yeah. like you know, I don't know, um, Bronte's sister or something like that, then we, we I might can't have, stand the Brontes. Yeah, yeah I, we we I might have like you know, yeah. 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 There's something yeah. there's something about like 19th century Russian or French fiction that yeah. it just it grips me i think because it's it's understandable but it's also completely d- different to how we live our lives yeah. now sure. know, going, going to balls and meeting princes and you know whatnot it's it's kind of ludicrous so so you can throw yourself into it because it's not the same as the day-to-day right okay it, so from one pretentious thing to another uh, <laughs> elon musk and mark zuckerberg who wins the fight Oh man, I hope they both like knock each other out at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> KO simultaneously. Yeah. I'm not a fan. 
I'm not on Facebook. I quit Facebook. Um, my wife convinced my wife, as I said, is German. So she's very interested in, you know, privacy laws and yeah. rights and the constitution and things like this. So she like 10 years ago convinced me after reading, you know, some horror articles about Facebook that um, my privacy was endangered. So I quit Facebook and she's still on it. And <laughs> oh, wow. Yes, yeah, so I am I am on Twitter. But as anyone who's on Twitter will attest, it's having serious trouble since Elon took over. And Elon, you know, defamed a cave rescuer by calling him a paedophile. Yeah. Which was unforgivable. So I, I don't like either of them, to be honest. I don't either. Yeah. yeah. So funny story with the Germans and their privacy. You walk into a German archive and they're sitting there with laptops. If you look at the camera on the screen, every single one of them will have a piece of tape over it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's see, um, I'm, I'm up. Let's see. What, what's uh, right? We're on the break. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're up. up you're yep. Up. Okay. Yep. Uh as you can tell, Hugh, this is a very uh, our production department sometimes fails us. It's and, seamless. Yeah, we're we're gonna have just... to we're gonna have to get on the interns. They've been slacking. Yeah, the interns are really slacking <laughs> off. It just, uh, so what's what's your what's your go to pub there there in Cardiff where you live? Oh, we've got quite a nice pub nearby called the Discovery Inn, and uh, uh, they're good for a Sunday roast dinner, which I, I quite like. Yeah, but um, I'm not a big pub person because I'm a I'm a teetotaler. I haven't drunk since I was 20 years old. Okay, and um, yeah, so I'm not. I'm coffee shops, cake, gelato. Let's talk gelato. I'm I'm happy. You know, gelato. That's a big thing for me. I will go with that. What is your gel? Where's your go-to gelato place? So there's a good place. There's there's two in Cardiff that I like, and the but the best one is in Germany. There's one near us, which is like a 20 minute walk away called uh, Joe's Ice Cream, which is a, um, a bit unwelcome to some people because it's a Swansea company and Swansea uh, and Cardiff have a big. Yeah. Little bit yeah. So, but I like it. And um, and then the but the better one is called Coco Gelato, where it's, you know, extravagant, ridiculously over the top, like massive yeah. amounts of stuff with sprinkles and exploding cotton can uh, candy balls and and this kind of thing but so. a 20 minute walk away that's that's ideal yeah that's nice. right that's ideal you can go like you earned it, it. Yeah. yeah and then walk it off afterwards yeah, mile there, mile back. Is, that's uphill as well on the way back so even even better but the the best one is in my wife's hometown in north germany it's called venezia and it's like a lot of places in germany it's like italian immigrants who went yeah. there in mm -hmm. the 60s and they're they're there in the in the summer and then in the winter they go back to italy where it's nicer yeah yep. <laughs> And so, uh, spaghetti ice. I was going to say, I was about that. You just took the words out of my mouth. I was about to say, <laughs> one of the things Americans don't understand that they are missing out on is spaghetti ice. I mean, I absolutely, I, I you know, I'm 46 years old and I'm, I'm going up to the window. I'm like, I, oh, yeah. know, spaghetti ice. <laughs> I, I've already got it planned into our holiday, like how on day one of arrival, the first thing on the agenda is to go and get a spaghetti ice. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and nobody will dare to disagree with me. Because no, they, yeah, yeah. The goodness. kids love it. Um, yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> All right, your favorite sports team. As you said, you don't have Facebook, so I couldn't find a whole lot about you. Um, but uh, you know, I'm I'm assuming you probably follow football and rugby. No, absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. I'm completely disinterested in any kind of like sports teams. Couldn't care less. Um, I've only been to like two real football matches ever in my life as a spectator. Um, both in quite intimidating places. One was in Portsmouth, which is a fairly, um, I don't know if rough is the right word, volatile, lively location. Yeah. <laughs> the other one was at Hamburg, uh, Hamburg Sport Verein, which is um, also quite a, a, a boisterous uh, club where there was a yeah. certain contingent of neo-Nazis when I went there as a teenager. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm not a sports fan person, but I do, for me, it's, it's tennis and swimming those are okay things. well okay well i'll ask you about tennis then were you um were you happy with the wimbledon results yeah i was very happy with alvarez i think alvarez yeah. is an, he's an interesting player to watch because yeah. he's just a little bit less predictable he's less kind of strategy and more personality in the way that he plays maybe that's because he's young maybe he'll yeah. get more boring as he as he ages but uh, and also, I don't like Djokovic. Uh, I don't either. Yeah, I'm not a fan of his the way he plays. 
he's quite a prima donna and his um his COVID opinions are not to my taste either. That's yeah. That's I, I I'm yeah. right there with you. That was an oh, amazing I, match, though. That that it was, was it was yeah, an it was incredible amazing to match. Watch. Yeah, yeah, it was it really it was brilliant, brilliant tennis to watch. Yeah. I, I'm kind of glad that this age of um you know Federer, uh and Djokovic and so on is coming to an end because it's just yeah opens things up more and makes it more. Yeah. Interesting well, it's watch. the same on I, the women's sides too. You know, with with yeah. Serena gone and and yeah. and of course. And also on the men's side with with Nadal, kind of it seems like he's yeah. on his way out. Um, yeah. That that serve that serve clock, I think, was the best thing for him because that dude can fidget more than oh, anybody I've ever seen yeah. in my life. <laughs> yeah, uh, but the, the, yeah, I'm with the you. women's final was heartbreaking though. I really wanted Jabor to win. Yeah, I did um, too. I, I like yeah. her a lot, and it was yeah. uh, you know watching that kind of psychological meltdown is 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 tough. Yep. All right. Last question. Um, as you know, from uh, you're you're a listener, um, Bill, the Texan, me, the South Carolinian, got uh, different ideas about barbecue, although we, we will eat each other's barbecue, of course. Um, so Bill is a brisket guy. I am pork. Where do you fall? I'm. I've got to disappoint you. It's a shame to go out on on a low point, but I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> oh wow! Okay, yeah. Okay, you know, yeah. we we we've had this before, and we've yeah. learned how to deal with I'm this appropriately. Sorry. Well, thanks for joining us, you. <laughs> yeah. All right, that's it. We're done. We will never speak again. <laughs> that's it. It's over. Yeah. So I'm not only my British and not you know that acquainted with uh, the American tradition of barbecue in the same way, but um, but I'm a vegetarian. I do get given, you know, there is always a barbecue in the summer in Germany. The Germans love a good barbecue as well. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. they do. And so they managed to find, like, actually vegetarian food in Germany now is as good, if not better, than in the UK. Yeah. Um, it used to be, like, <laughs> when I was a teen teenager and a child, I used to get taken to France with my mother. <coughs> and the French what? definition of vegetarian in, like, the early 1990s was nearly as hilarious as when I went to Kenya for the first time and um was fed chicken because chickens are not proper animals yeah um, so <laughs> yeah so what, what do, you, do you surely though you, you do you grill veggies veg yeah i like uh, you know tofu sausage mm -hmm. or corn sausage or something of that something of that nature yeah but, yeah um, like if it's down to me my go-to like maybe for you if that's like a, a treat or a luxury thing that you'll do on a special occasion the equivalent for me is a curry Oh yeah, yeah. No, yeah. can't go wrong yeah. there for sure. Yeah. Um, hey, the the Germans have a uh, vegan currywurst now. I mean, you can uh, at most uh, currywurst shops you can you can get it done vegan. So, uh, and it's tofu, I think, or soy mm -hmm. or something like that. You know, you know, in the like, yeah. I don't know if you've had like, I don't know if it's Impossible Burger or Beyond. One of the two has they've got sausages now. Yeah, and mm -hmm. they're really not. Terry and I tried them sometime in the last semester, and they really weren't too bad. Um, they're, they're fat. They're, they're saturated fat contents just out the roof, though. Yeah. I mean, it's like taste wise, they're about the same. And I know ethically, I hate to say it, but you might as well just eat the real thing <laughs> as far as <laughs> all the crap that's listed in the know. ingredients. You know? so <laughs> if you go through that that specific you know part, well, yeah, and it's, and you it's, know the it's like sixes. I don't know the the fifteen hundred gallons of water it takes to produce one impossible burger. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. I mean, there, there's yeah. all these. I don't know. It's like, can, can we just not find something that I can win with? It's like gelato. That, that's probably what? it, actually. I don't yeah. know. But, mm. um, so one thing I'm going to do, Brian, when we hit 100 episodes, yeah, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and splice together all 100 responses to the barbecue question. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. <laughs> and yeah. just do it like like pork, brisket, pork, yeah. pork, 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 vegan, yeah. pork, 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 vegetarian, pork, right? Yeah. And and do and do that and slice up the I think that would be pretty cool. Yeah. But this is uh, this is really a barbecue podcast disguised as a military. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well if you listen to Adam Sipes episode, I mean, oh my gosh, he went off on a treatise. He, yeah. <laughs> on barbecue pros and cons that lasted yeah. like 30 minutes it was and great. he was angry about it like... oh he, yeah he had strong he had strong feelings very strong feelings <laughs> about all this. but anyway yeah. hugh thanks man Take it's care. great to see you yeah we'll thanks. see you in so lisbon yeah. 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 yeah yeah see you there for sure man all right bye. take care bye
Hey folks, thanks for listening to this episode of Military Historians or People Too. Brian heads up the research department and our social media division, and Bill heads up production, editing, and Muzak. We're not monetized, and we depend upon you, dear listener, to help us spread the word about this podcast. So tell your friends, share on social media, listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Overcast, and wherever the heck you get your podcast. If you need an idea for your class, make them listen to military historians of people too. Give them some extra credit. Thanks for listening.